so I'm not going to take a lot of your time because um, I think it's important that uh, we spend more time listening to Callum today. Um, but maybe I'll just briefly say that, you know, Lacan was a psychoanalyst. He was speaking to psychoanalysts. Uh, when we speak uh, about Lacan's teaching, we usually speak about seminars because Lacan barely wrote anything. Yes, he taught and he taught analysts. He didn't teach social scientists or philosophers. He taught analysts. So his teaching is about doing analysis. So we ask ourselves then, well, what is this deal? Why are we speaking about discourses, about culture? Uh, why are we giving this talk here in, in this social sciences department? And well, we have to contextualize this maybe historically and understand that Lacan got to his discourse theory, we might call it in scare quotes, 17 years into his teaching. Right? So it was only in his 17th seminar uh, and that was a, a very interesting time. That was 68, right? Was it? 69, 69 even. A year, a year after the, uh, uh, the uh, Paris uh, Commune and uh, the many, many uh, uprisings that we saw at that time, Lacan decided to speak about discourses, to speak about uh, these uh, linguistic structures. Mm -hmm. So this happened later in his career. Uh, after many, many, many things have been said about language and about people who speak it because the analyst listens. This is how Freud called this cure, stealing, stealing this word from Anna O, uh, the speaking cure, the, talk, the talking cure, redecure, right? Analysts listen to speech. So language is definitely at stake. Uh, what I'm here to do today is to sort of slowly get you into uh, thinking about discourses, uh, but starting with some basic intuitions about the role of language in Lacan's psychoanalysis. And I'm going to do this today. Um, I'm taking the function of a storyteller today. I'm gonna tell some myths because they are the most compelling. You know, why the, the Oedipus myth is, the is one of the most compelling because it's like a story and we like stories. So I'm going to tell you stories in order to take you from one basic assumption that Lacan makes, which is that to be human is to be a speaking being. Uh, this plays on a Descartes' uh, invention. Uh, René Descartes talked about the thinking being. For Lacan, it is about speech. It is about a speaking being. And to take you from there, slowly bringing you uh, into acquaintance with uh, four algebraic notations that Callum will very skillfully use in his presentation of the discourses in Lacan. This is what Lacan does after 17 years. He uses these algebraic notations that I would venture to, I would wager to say that are already implicit in his initiatory work on language and the way that we become human humanize through our entry into language. So this is what I'm going to do today. I'm already telling you in advance, spoiler, spoiling it. So when I say that to be human is to be a speaking being, I am saying to you, and I'll, I'll go to great lengths to, to, to explain this, that human reality is structured like a language. This is uh, quite an obscure saying. Yes, it could mean many things, and I'll, I'll explain uh, what I mean. Uh, because uh, when I say this, that human reality is structured like a language, I also mean that it is structured as a discourse. Now, in order to explain this assumption, I'll tell you a little story that I, uh, I tell from time to time in order to get you into uh, the work of Jakob Johann von Ulskul, which I always have a hard time finding on Google because I never remember how to spell his name. <laughs> but now I wrote it and I kept it on my des desktop so I can find it. Uh, Lacan talks about him in his, um, in his paper on the mirror stage. So very early Lacan, very, very beginning of, of his teaching. So um, this is a story about a cow 
uh, a very special cow that I uh, met uh, many years ago. I visited uh, a certain uh, facility for postdocs research, doing research on uh, cows. And I stayed there for a few nights. And, uh, and one night, uh, one of the students wakes me up at four in the morning and they tell me that I should join them to see a cow giving birth. They said, it's a miracle. You have to see it. It's a very special thing. And we went and we, we observed that. And it was very special. It was a very special moment. Uh, but what struck me in that moment was what happened right after the, this little calf was born into the world. Because she didn't wait one second to get up on her leg. It was a little, uh, a little problematic in the beginning. She had some hard time getting on her legs, but she did. And immediately she starts sniffing around, looking around, searching for something for food, for friends, I don't know. But she was walking around, already getting acquainted with the world, with the world she was born into. So we can say that for cows, there is something hardwired already on the instinctual level. She didn't, nobody taught her anything. She didn't need to go through a course like you are doing here, right? Immediately she was born. And, and this, this means that something on the hardwired instinctual level complies with the environment that this cow is born into. That's a miracle. Uh, I would say, and I'll write it down because uh, not everybody here is a, is a German, uh, a native German speaker, um, me included, uh, but we'll use Urskul's uh, terms. That means that there is a direct relationship between these ca this cow's Innenwelt and Umwelt. And here we're, I'm borrowing term, a terms from von Urskul, right? I'm, I'm not inventing this. Um, well, Urskul argued that animals don't occupy what in German we would call the Außenwelt, right? The outer world. They occupy the Umwelt. The translation is environment, I think, in English, but usually philosophers call it milieu in French. So we translate it to milieu. Now in animals, Umwelt, and I'm quoting Ulkskul here, constitutes a unity closed in on itself, each part of it's determined by the significance it receives from the subject of this Umwelt. Now the best example that people know about Ulkskul that he gives for an Umwelt is the tick. It's a disgusting example and very relevant for Germany because there are ticks here, right, in summer. It's when you go to the festival, you come back home with a tick, right? So Uxkel describes uh, the tick and its umwelt. And uh, he says that the, the, the factors that uh, constitute the umwelt uh, corresponds to the tick's hardwired instincts that concern its capacity uh, and, let's say, striving towards survival and procreation. So the tick climbs on branches and then it drops on animals uh, and then it sucks their blood, right? And the tick has no eyes. It does not see like us. Its skin is sensitive to sunlight and that orients its climbing. So this is why it climbs uh, upwards. It can only smell a single odor. That's uh, but butric acid. This is a secretion that uh, is given off in the sweat of all mammals. And when it senses a warm object below, it drops on its prey and it searches for a patch of hair. And then it pierces the host's soft skin and sucks its blood. Right? This is the life of a tick. Uh, so we say that the umwelt of the tick is made up of these elements that have a meaning for the tick. Sunlight, the smell of butyric acid, the tactile sense of mammalian heat, hair and soft skin, and the taste of blood. So we see that its umwelt is a closed world of elements outside of which nothing else exists. Right? This is the umwelt uh, of the tick. Now, this is a for, for an Ulkskul, very crucial point is that although it seems that all animals in here inhabit the same universe, according to him, each animal lives in a different subjectively determined 
Umwelt. So this is a species determined Umwelt. And now I want you to imagine a wild animal. And I mean this in the uh, hypothetical strict sense. A wild animal is, a, is an animal that is perfect in surviving and procreating. It needs to rely on nothing but its original hardwired instincts. So in, in imagining this animal, I'm imagining a, an eagle. I don't know, it's, it's amazing. It hunts all the prey and it has the, 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 the procreates and creates uh, offspring. And we would say that this wild animal is characterized by a direct relationship between the Innenwelt and the Umwelt. They directly comply. They are born into the world perfectly. But for human babies, this is not the case. I don't know if you've met human babies in your life, but when they are born, they are not ready for the Umwelt. Not to the least. Um, I, I would even uh, venture to say that if you leave a baby to fend up for itself, it would die. Hmm? The Innenwelt is not ready for the Umwelt uh, for human beings. And we can characterize this as a certain organic inadequacy, right? A chasm that characterizes the human baby, a chasm between the Innenwelt and the Umwelt. And what's the way that uh, human babies or humans use choose to suture this chasm, you might have guessed. You, you, you should guess, yeah? Language, huh? So, yeah, that's the answer, right? That I was expecting at least. <laughs> so they use language. They suture this wound through language. And now I don't speak about the English language. I don't, I'm not saying the English language, the German language. This is not what I mean. I mean, First of all, language in the wide sense. So I mean traces of memory, psychic inscriptions that mark the contours of our body, that enables us to situate ourselves in a three-dimensional space and operate our sensory organs in the world. Anything that is inscribed and remains, right? We have to have that in the psyche in order to, be, to become human. And here Lacan says, one has to assume a prior and at least partial organization of language in order for memory and historization to work, basically. But I also mean language in a discursive sense. I mean the logic, the ideas, the rules, the meanings that come to us through culture. To become human is not only to control your limbs, it's to navigate social reality. Uh, so this here, I mean human reality in the deep sense, in the sense of art, in the sense of science, in the sense of politics and love. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, Freud identifies the Oedipus. Psychoanalysis is already interested in that domain. It's not only interested uh, in uh, the functioning of the body, of libido, but also in the Oedipus. It's something that comes from there. Mm -hmm. Freud says there is nothing that prevents us from um, committing incest. Right? It comes not from the, orga the organic, it comes from the cultural. So in order to participate in human life, one has to enter the structure of language and discourse. And they allow us to experience a relationship to reality, to other people, to our bodies, to whatever we call human reality. So being human means using language to suture the gap between in the Innenwelt and the Umwelt. And the way that one uses language in order to do that marks, uh, let's say, the, the marks subjectivity itself and the way into the social bond. Mm -hmm. um, but unlike wild animals, and this is uh, what uh, Freud already tells us uh, in the beginning, uh, this suturing, this mending is not a fixing. It's not, uh, it's not a solution that solves the problem. And in this sense, I'm saying there is no wild human that is in touch with nature. There is no such thing. Or in psychoanalysis, we say there is no healthy subject. There is no someone who is not a bit insane, colloquially, let's say that. Hmm? Because every attempt to such a gap using language would be partial and it would fail. 
And in Lacan's work and Lacan's psychoanalysis, he is interested in this inherent failure, which he calls alienation. Right? He calls this the alienation in one's entry into language. And I will introduce you to this. And from that, I'll introduce you to some figures and we'll, we'll clear the stage for Callum. So I'll start with a myth. Again, I told you I'm here to tell you some stories. So some more stories about babies being born, now human babies, not cows. So when a baby is born, um, he is, uh, they are introduced into the harsh uh, reality uh, of the world. Mm? And let's assume that, and this is just an assumption, that in the womb, the fetus has all of its instinctual needs answered immediately. Okay, let's say in the womb, everything is perfect. This is what we imagine, although this is not true. We've already seen that babies have gas in the womb as well. It's quite troubling, right? So that's only a hypothesis, but be that as it may, after the baby is born, there necessarily comes a moment, it, it happens to everyone, uh, where the baby's needs are not satisfied. You know, the baby is hungry in the middle of the night, uh, but uh, the caretaker is not awake and does not feed it, right? So the baby then um, experiences uh, a moment of non-satisfaction, right? Something is not satisfied. And this introduces a lack into uh, the child's psychic economy. And what does this compel a baby to cry? Usually, it compels the baby to cry, right? Hmm? The baby cries, and when we think about this cry, prior to any function that it might carry in conveying a message, prior to any particular message that it might mean, a cry is already by itself an appeal to another place, to the caretaker. In Lacanese, we say an appeal to the other, to the big other. And I'll explain in a second what this means. So, through the cry, the baby's first demands are articulated and addressed to the other in order for the latter to take care of this unbearable tension that the unfulfilled need struck up, right? So we call to the other. So this is a side note, and I think this will be relevant for what we talk about later, is uh, there are many ways to engage with this notion, the big other in Lacan and they mean different things in different points of his career. For the sake of our discussion today, we will think of the other as the place of language, a language that precedes the existence of the subject and is introduced to the subject when it enters language. Or more precisely, I'll say that the other is the locus of discourse, the place of discourse that is shared by subjects in culture, where units of meaning determine psychic reality on a symbolic level, right? So this is the other for us. And when the baby enters language in this way, a certain gulf is created still hmm? uh, between the intimate nonverbal world of the instincts and what we might identify as this unmediated experience of the body on the one hand, and on the other hand, the domain of meaning, of words, of what of the body succumbs to explanation, to language, to definition. Mm -hmm. This schism is painful, and it's sometimes extremely traumatic. It splits the so-called wholeness of experience, and it forces the subjects to hold these two incommensurable aspects at the same time. Right? This is what we have to do. And well, this is what Lacan calls the moment of alienation, this traumatic moment. And we can articulate in, in three corresponding, uh, as on three corresponding levels. And I'll present them to you right now. First, you know, the baby needs to take whatever is of this most intimate instinctual dynamic, whatever is of the original vivacity of the body, and translate this into a linguistic utterance. This would never encapsulate it. This would never explain it. This would never fully encapsulate this. And I think, I think Danny Nobis talks about the cocktail. Uh, no, it's, well, there's the cocktail, uh, cocktail uh, test for that. 
go to a cocktail party and someone asks you who are you, who you really are? Who are you really? And it doesn't matter how many words you will use, you will never be able to express that fully. Right? So language lacks. There is a certain problematic in language. It cannot really express what I am intending, what the baby is intending, or, or uh, what is the intention of the baby at that moment. And this is why we speak of alienation. It is alienated. Then the baby does this by relying on an alien language, on a language that is not belongs to him, to, as predates the existence of the baby and belongs to other people. Right? Another alienation. And then finally, because the baby appeals to the caretaker, to the other, with the cry, the baby then retroactively constitutes that place outside of him as the place where, from which it's most its most intimate instinctual needs would be answered. So what is most intimately mine will actually be answered from outwards. This is alienation, three dimensions uh, of alienation. Uh, now, what alienation basically means, and I'll now say this in more simpler terms, it means that a baby becomes a human child because it identifies with the images and words that are presented by his parents and other important people in general, right? So these other are representatives for culture, for dominant culture. And Lacan epitomizes these uh, others and culture in general in his concept of the big other. And in alienation, we say that the subject identifies with signifiers in the other. Uh, these signifiers, they constitute whatever we know about the subject in psychoanalysis, the unconscious and attach the subject to culture, right? So <clears throat> what uh, we might say is that, uh, and I'm, I'll write it here for you, is that in alienation, the subject, and this is the S, is put under the bar. It is represented by, it's not represented by itself, it's represented by a signifier that is uh, adopted uh, from the other, right? And this signifier, this signifier that the subject adopts, represents the subject to all other signifiers that exist in culture, right? So the baby takes on itself one signifier that represents me, I'm a good boy, let's say. And then through this good boy, whatever it means to me, it's a very particular meaning because my mother told that to me at a certain point and that meant something particular for me. This then can represent me in a society, in Excuse uh, me. a community Excuse me. of subjects. Excuse me, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, we Hello. have one Zoom thing, but I'll, I'm really um, at Leon. finishing, so uh, please. No, no, Leon, that. Leon, it's not a question. When you write on the board, could you write low on the board? Oh, because like the this. people at home can't see it against the whiteness. Is that better? It's vaguely better, but a black pen would be better as well. <laughs> oh, a black pen. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no worries, no worries. I can't see. Is that better? Oh, that's great. So. Yeah, so I'll continue, Callum, I'm gonna scare them a bit. I'm scaring you a bit now, but it's gonna be a much, much nicer very soon. Yes, so it's good to, to, to have a, ba we're bad cop, good cop today, right? Yeah, bad cop, right? Bad cop, bad cop. So I was, <laughs> bad cop, even worse cop, right? So I was saying that, and this is, these are just the figures of the algebra that I want to introduce you to, because we're gonna do some work with them very soon in, in, in our understanding of this course. So, in alienation, in, in one's entry into language, yeah, and, and we would say, this is just to make you a little curious if you want to learn a little bit more about this later. Um, so in the alienation in language, the subject 
is identif identifies with a signifier coming from outside, right? Whatever mommy called me as a young boy, right? I identify with that. And that thing unconsciously represents me in discourse, in the domain of culture, in among other meanings in the world, right? This is how I get my designation as a subject, right? It is an identification. Uh, some form of identity is received and attributed to the subject. But this identity doesn't come from me. It comes from the subject. It comes from the place of language. So this means that alienation marks our identity as ontologically foreign, as coming from another place. This is a huge problem for identity politics, I think. Um, now, what I've already said is that ling the linguistic translation of, let's say, the body the most intimate instinctual dynamic can never fully encapsulate it, right? There is a problem of language. Language cannot encapsulate everything. And in this sense, um, for this exact reason, uh, we say that, well, uh, this original tension of the body can never be fully represented or mastered by language by the other. And it is precisely for that reason that we have a certain uh, structural opening here in alienation. And this opening entails a certain lacking, a certain overlapping, and here we use the two circles again, between the place that language cannot translate and the place that is intranslatable in the subject. And this is where Lacan situates this little letter. You might know it if you've read Lacan in the past, or if you've heard of him, this little A, or je petit A, the object cause of desire. We'll just place it there because we're gonna use it in, in the algebra. And what uh, Lacan says is that when the subject is represented in the other, in this interaction, uh, the subject ascribes a specific position both to itself and the other in this intersection, situating what we call the object, uh, where the enigmatic desire uh, of the other is interpreted and kickstarts the singular desire of the subject. And this is a byproduct of alienation. Lacan calls this separation. It's a certain libidinal leftover that ties the subject and culture together. So to end my introduct introductory talk and sort of let you uh, speak in more uh, comprehensible terms uh, and, and give Canon the stage as quickly as possible, I will um, direct you to these notations. And well, you'll see that uh, Callum will use them in a much more sophisticated way when speaking about discourse. Yeah. So it was important for me to present them to you as they sort of grew out of Lacan's psychoanalytic thesis about subjectivity. Mm -hmm. But what, what we will see is that Lacan will use them, these uh, notations, the bar the S, the S1, S2, and the A. So it will use them to establish two forms of algebra. The first exemplifies the way the subject negotiates with the demands of the social bond, with the demands of the other. And these engender clinical structures. This is what you know as neurosis, psychosis, perversion, what I argue is autism. But there's a second algebra, and this will be our topic today, which describes how the social bond negotiates its own rationale, its own logos with economies of subjects, right? So with, with communities of subjects. And in this sense, it won't engender clinical structures. It will engender discursive structures, right? And this, this will be our, our topic today. And this sort of dual algebra is, is accompanies Lacan in his teaching. And it assumes a certain interdependence between the individual within culture and the culture within the individual. So this adheres to a certain psychoanalytic dictum that uh, we already see in Freud, uh, which uh, dictates interpreting psychic life as already being implicated in cultural life and vice versa. And this is the dictum that culminates, I think, uh, in Lacan's 17th seminar and his discourse theory. And today we're gonna to delve deeply into this topic and to, in their relevance for the cultural psychological view 
according to which culture, psyche, and body make each other up. So I hope uh, this, this, uh, this introductory lecture was uh, keep, kept you a little curious and will get you uh, investigating a little more. And Callum, I think we can, uh, we can get right to it, the work. Yeah. Unless there are some questions, of course. Yeah. Please. Uh, but, uh, with the inadequacy of language, mm -hmm. um, this question about it, isn't that the second step from already like the child itself not fully being able to grasp the body? Because, like, there's, isn't there already a difference between like the real of the body or like all the experiences and what a child or a human being? Like can experience of these effects. Like I'm coming a bit from Spinoza's idea, mm -hmm. like, uh, like the uh, like the Holmes talk of uh, the imaginary, like what we come from that. Mm -hmm. Spinoza already says like that's the first step mm -hmm. of like um, like taking in our body, like without even the layer of language. That is problematic. Yeah. Uh, so you know is. Is there a second step there, or mm. is that just like another way of looking at it? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on this. It's funny because we had this discussion in another course I'm teaching this week. Um, because, you know, basically for Freud, um, there is no such thing as unconscious affects. He's very explicit in saying that. So affects are things that affect us consciously. This is an affect. This is an emotion. Whatever is consciously experienced. Right. So when we speak about affects as a conscious experience of the body, because affects are what affects our body, we definitely are talking about something that is post language. Language already mediates it, right? Because it is consciously experienced. It is experienced in a certain structure, right? Now, what I do agree with you is we are talking about two st steps here in alienation, right? First, there is a certain adoption of an identity, an entry into language. Maybe with even the fantasy that language can, in fact, uh, articulate everything about me. This is a common neurotic uh, misconception, a belief. Uh, let's say this is the uh, scientific delusion, even the belief that language, that nature is written in language, right? That we can one day describe everything using language, right? So this is this is the first step that we might call alienation, but. Like uh, what every analysis goes through in their analysis, they reach a point where language it, it hits a wall, right? There is nothing it, we are capable to say, and one encounters the lack in language, the lack in the other. So this entails a second step, which is described here, right? So where language is lacking, where I cannot find a solution in, 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 in a ready-made form, where I cannot find a solution in the book, I have to put in something that is singular, that is unique to me. I have to put in something that is not a word, right? But something that is more like, um, well, like an object hmm? or like something that is more like a movement, something that would move me. And this is the second step that we talk about in alienation that is described here. This is where the A is introduced. This is why, by the way, Lacan insists that he's not a structuralist. Because for him, a lack in structure is a necessary condition. Uh, yeah, there is something here on the on the right hand side, which describes the, the the fact that language cannot articulate everything. Yes, but it doesn't end there. Right? We can take one takes a step in their analysis hmm, uh, where this uh, object kind of shows itself or falls off, as we say. Hmm? Yeah. So very good questions, huh? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, 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 why not? Again, we have to understand that Lacan is not sitting um, at home and sort of deducing formulas and building up a philosophy. Lacan meets patients and he deduces something from their symptom, from the way they speak, from the way they speak about their lives. And what, uh, what la necessitates Lacan to, uh, to uh, hypothesize the place of the object uh, in one's entry into language is the fact that, well, if indeed 
we could identify with a signifier that would represent us in the world in a sufficient way, well, that would be the end of, of any movement in life. You would really reach a point where you can relax for the rest of your life, right? This is what we always wait for. You know, you are here, it's uh, what, it's seven? No, it's five in the afternoon. Why are you not home? Yes, you are clearly neurotic people. Hmm? Uh, something drives you to come here, although you can just sit under a tree and enjoy your life. But th this thing that we have to hypothesize, to postulate is this A, because you've already had your BA, you already read your book, but it's not enough. It's never enough. Language is never enough. It's, it never brings your movement to an end, right? So Lacan was saying, well, in my algebra here, something is missing, something that cannot be articulated by language. And this is exactly object A, right? It's a lack. It's not something that can be said. There's a difference between the object cause of desire and the object of desire. We desire objects. We desire a new iPhone. And we go and, on Amazon and we buy it. And we think that all our problems will be solved after. And we will finally feel at least content, yes? And we buy the iPhone and we're happy for, for two hours, but it doesn't stop. That's wrong. <laughs> This is, uh, I think, uh, we can think about it from a Buddhist perspective as well, in the, the, the structure of desire. So Lacan was hypothesizing then that there is something in the psychic, psychic structure that has to be represented in his algebra, which has to represent a place where language cannot speak. But the body does. Yes, we keep on moving. We keep on waking up every morning, coming to university. Why? God knows. Yeah. So that's the place of A ah, here, of, of Hoje. Ah. Christian, and then, uh, then we'll, we'll carry on. So, excellent. Yeah, but the way you and Lacan, probably, I have no idea, um, I do this that the problem is language and, and that there's a difference between what I want to say and what I'm able to say. And I disagree because I know what I want to say and I can do that. The problem is that I'm not understood. That is the problem. Mm -hmm. Well, I know what I mean. And I can represent myself 100%, but mm -hmm. I'm not understood. That's the problem. Well, there, there's several ways to address that. For instance, for, first, first way is, um, let's say, the symptom. When someone comes to the clinic, they complain. And usually it's not something very simple that uh, CBT can sort of very easily uh, fix. You know, someone says, all I want is to find a wife. All I want in my life is to find a wife, to get married and have kids. This is what I want. I swear, this is what I want. But whenever I meet someone who's, who barely fits uh, the description of, of a person that I would like, I immediately dump her. Why? Oh, all I want is to finish my PhD. This is very common. But whenever I sit down on the computer, all I do is go on YouTube. Why? It's not what I want, right? Because here we have a certain problematic. This is what brings people to the clinic. This, this uh, lack. On the other hand, I can give you another example from the field of love. Uh, I know, Christian, you are a man in love. And uh, well, I can ask you, why do you love your partner? And you'll say, well, she's, uh, she's very beautiful. And I'll tell you, well, but there are more beautiful uh, people in the world. Maybe you should love them. And you say, no, no, it's not only because she's beautiful. She's also very smart. I say, well, there are smarter and more smarter and more beautiful people, I'm sure. But you say, but she writes beautiful poetry. And I tell you, well, there are better poets. So the point is that there is a certain incapacity to describe something in, in, inherent and important about love. Language cannot articulate it. And there are things in our lives that are like that. And these are the most exciting things. These are very exciting things. We derive enjoyment out of them. But what Lacan was saying is, well, it's different for everyone, but we have to assume it there. So we had to include it in his algebra. And what I presented here is this algebra that sort of grows out, branches out of this idea of one psychology and the psychic structure. But what Callum will demonstrate is how we use this same exact algebra in thinking about discourses in, in society. And Lacan made a wager, and this is Callum's wager today. He made a wager that that is interesting, that is important, and that is useful. And we'll see today if that is indeed the case. This is a question that will open up today. <laughs>